Thank you all to the first uh, event uh, this year in the uh, Initiative for the Science of the Human Past at Harvard. We are really thrilled to have with us uh, David Reich, who's going to be doing some uh, really cool things in a few moments. Just a few words, whoops, um, uh, what the science of the human past is. Uh, it started up about three or four years ago. We hope it's getting stronger and better. The goal is to bring together uh, scholars, scientists, of, at all levels in this university, from freshmen uh, in the program all the way to the most senior professors and beyond, to bring together the power of the sciences of all descriptions, the life sciences, the computer sciences, the physical sciences, environmental sciences, to uh, uncover new data about the human past and to interpret it, to work through it together in groups of people from all kinds of intellectual horizons. So this is uh, a little bit of the overall picture. Come visit our website. Uh, this talk, uh, thanks to the gracious uh, agreement of Professor Reich, will be recorded and put up on our website for those who can't join us physically. Um, and let's see how the, hmm? <laughs> Get back up on the stage, Mike. What? No? Keep trying. Plug this in, Mike. This? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> teamwork, teamwork. Just as in the science of the human past, so in productions of talks, it's good to have teamwork, especially when somebody knows what they're doing. <laughs> Unlike me. Let's try that again. <laughs> ah, there we go. Here we are tonight. This is what we're up for tonight. Um, it should be very, very interesting. David Reich will be talking about his really transformative research. And we'll have the privilege of having uh, comments from Dr. Nick Patterson, who is without question the most uh, historically astute and learned mathematician I've ever encountered in my life by a factor of about 50. Um, this is the initiative of, this is the steering committee of the Initiative for the Science of the Human Past. As you can see, we're drawn from across the university, uh, from uh, the medical school through the School of Public Health, including Divinity and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and it really is a team effort. No one of us has the, all the expertise that's required, and we get a lot better when we talk together. I want to let you know that the historical ice core, this is the first ice core ever conceived and executed from the, ground, from the ice up, from the mountains up, uh, with historical questions by a joint team of historians, archaeologists, and climate scientists, uh, was retrieved by the science of the human past with funding from the Arcadia Fund of London in, in uh, a blizzard, many blizzards, in, in uh, 20, late 2013. The helicopter made it up. We have, a, we have a picture of the helicopter almost not making it up with the half million dollar ice core in a sling below it. It has made it up. We've been working nonstop on it since Christmas 2013 when the ice reached the Climate Center, Insti Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine with my friend Paul Majewski, who is the co-director of the project. We will be presenting the first public uh, report on our discoveries on November 11th, I believe at 5 p.m. And the venue will be announced. I think it'll be in Boylston Hall. So put that into your agendas. It should be pretty cool, as it were. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, this will give you just some of the ideas. That's the initial reading of data of calcium for about uh, for 500 years. Uh, it's extraordinary the amount of data that has emerged from this and it'll be very interesting to see the historical picture that can, it can come from it. Um, we have projects going also in the areas of pathogens. It is, uh, we're planning, uh, we're in the planning stages of a meeting on uh, new discoveries as yet unpublished in the history of Yersinia pestis, uh, that is to say bubonic plague, from the plague of Justinian. Some important new discoveries are occurring in, in a lab that we're working closely with uh, in Germany. And uh, we have a seminar ongoing that I came running from just a few moments ago here in Cambridge on the on mass deaths in late antiquity, focusing on the Justinianic pandemic of the 6th and 7th century. So we're going to uh, expand that to include the genetic and the new ancient DNA evidence, and we hope to have a presentation in early December, bringing together both the German group and the Harvard group. 
The Digital Atlas is ongoing. We hope that's a resource that many of you are finding and that perhaps some of you wish to contribute to. Uh, we are, we, when the, as each of our projects comes to fulfillment, we will be putting the geodatabases that are relevant to it up on the web where everyone can download them and use them for their own research, whether it's the, the measurements of climate uh, signals from chemicals or the historical databases of weather reports in the uh, written records of Latin and Greek antiquity, Syriac antiquity. Dr. Alex Moore is our postdoc for the ice core here at Harvard this year. We have three of them working on the project, two in Maine and one at, at Heidelberg, uh, one split between Maine and Heidelberg. Um, and uh, this is very, very cool. Check it out on the web if you haven't uh, until now. Isotopic Silk Route, we're making huge progress there. This is due to the pioneering work of uh, my colleague Noreen Turos, who is on the steering committee. Noreen is the Landon Clay Professor of Scientific Archaeology in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology, which is well represented here in this, uh, in this venue. And uh, she has discovered a most amazing uh, new method, which allows her to identify where on the globe a caterpillar munched on his, mul his or her mulberry leaves, and which will allow us to identify the geographic origin of every piece of archaeological silk preserved in the archaeological record from the beginning of time. Uh, we, the, uh, the uh, SOHB, had a team in Tbilisi uh, working in the uh, State Silk Museum in August collecting samples of cocoons. This will be very fundamental to our work. Um, it, if it looks like it was fun there in the museum, it was fun, but it was 108 degrees Fahrenheit and they do not have air conditioning. But we got it done. So with no further ado, I would invite our dear friend and illustrious colleague, David Reich, to come to the podium and to take us toward a new history and geography of human genes informed by ancient DNA. David, I think, needs almost no introduction. He's so famous around the world. He should be pretty famous here at Harvard. Uh, and it's just a great joy and pleasure to have David here. Excuse me, we just have to switch to USB stick. Not, it's not on. I have to switch computers again. Great. Um, thank you. Um, um, it's it's um, uh, it's an uh, it's an honor to be invited um, to come um, speak here with uh, my colleague, Nick Patterson, who I've been working with now for um, 15 years, probably, um, I think. Um, and um, uh, we co-run a laboratory in Harvard Medical School um, where uh, we work on mostly learning about human history and biology using genetic variation data. Um, in the last uh, seven years, we've been working very closely uh, on ancient DNA, beginning with our work in collaboration with Svante Pabo um, in the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, where we got involved in the Neanderthal Genome Sequencing Project. At the time, we weren't involved in ancient DNA work at all, but um, the Svante's lab was, lab was doing amazing things and had really pioneered the technology and invented the technology for doing this. Um, what we, uh, uh, and, and we, we got a chance to be involved in the Neanderthal Genome Project as part of the team that tried to study how the Neanderthal and other archaic sequences were related to modern human sequences. Um, Svante and colleagues helped us to set up an ancient DNA laboratory here um, in Boston in the beginning of 2013 at this university um, for studying periods that they were not as interested in, and uh, we've learned a tremendous amount working with them and continue to work with them. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today is largely the work we've done in this laboratory on population transformations in Europe in the last 10,000 years. So the outline of this talk is going to be on three papers, really, that have come from this research program. Um, uh, um, and I'll tell you about each in turn in the part, uh, in the context of this talk. Um, this work was done by many, many people, and some of the most um, contributing people are over here. Uh, Joseph Lazaridis, um, a population geneticist who we work with, uh, Ian Matheson, another population geneticist, Nick Patterson, who I co-run the laboratory with, 
Wolfgang Hock, a collaborator who's now in Jena in Germany, but was at, in Australia in Adelaide at the time we worked on this project together. Nadine Rowland, who set up and directs our ancient DNA lab. Uh, Shat Malik, who works on our computers and directs our computer group. Uh, David Anthony, um, a colleague at Hartwick College, who um, led a lot of the work on uh, step populations, uh, Kurt Alt um, in various universities in uh, Germany and Austria and Switzerland, um, who has collected and assembled many of the samples, and Johannes Krause, uh, who was in Tübingen at the time and is now in Jena. Um, so the motivation for some of the, or, or at least the frame that I, I'd like to sort of introduce for thinking about some of these questions is the kind of pots versus people question. Um, the question about how these big cultural changes evident in the linguistic and archaeological record um, got to be, uh, got, got, came about, and whether we can gain insight about these events through DNA studies. So the top map is, the, is a linguistic map of uh, the colored uh, parts of, the, of Western Eurasia correspond to places where Indo-European languages are spoken. This is a closely related family of languages that clearly stem from a common ancestral language origin and are distributed all the way from Iran and India to Iceland and to Western Europe. Um, they are not distributed very much in the Near East, and they haven't been distributed very much there for the last 5,000 years because we have writing from the Near East over that period of time, and the great majority of languages from this region are not from the Near East. It's one of the great mysteries um, that still remains unsolved, but it's been a mystery for more than 200 years, why the language distribution is so broad and looks like this. Another uh, piece of evidence that's very important is the archaeological spread of farming across Europe. Uh, farming is invented in the Near East, according to the archaeological evidence, by around 11,000 years ago, and spreads into Europe beginning around 8,500 years ago into the Balkans, and then by about 6,000 years ago reaches the far corners of Europe, Scandinavia, and Britain. So the spread of farming through Europe is a dramatic phenomenon, and a question has always been, is that mediated by communication of ideas, um, people learning farming techniques from their neighbors, or is there some degree of migration contributing to that spread? Similar questions arise in the case of the linguistic spread of Indo-European languages. So the first part of this talk um, is about evidence that people in Europe today descend largely, although not completely, from three highly divergent ancestral populations um, that were not all in Europe 8,000 years ago, reflecting two major migrations that occurred after 8,000 or 8,500 years ago. So one of the things I'm going to do in these three parts of the talk is have this little box here describing the number of samples that um, are being reported in these studies. Um, our group um, has in each of these cases, these are the largest studies that ever, were ever reported at the time. And a little bit more than a year ago, we reported this study, which was the largest ancient DNA study that had been done at the time in the sense of the largest number of samples with data that was genome-wide for the first time. These were nine samples dating between seven to 8,000 years ago um, with which, with, for which we had genome-wide data. And over for the next two parts of the talk, I'm going to show you how much the amount of how much the data has increased um, in just the last year that we can access, just to give you a picture of how much we are rapidly learning um, and able to learn because of the massive ability to the, the, the great increase in the ability to, to learn about history from genetic data. So the situation before 2014 um, was really set by this important paper by Ponta Skogland and co colleagues that was published in 2012, where they had obtained um, a little bit of ancient DNA data from people from southern Scandinavia. And so they had genome-wide data from uh, a, a few people from southern Scandinavia. And these were people living about 5,000 years ago in, a, in two different archaeological contexts, a um, funnel beaker archaeological contexts and a pitted ware context. One of these was a farming culture related to farming cultures of Central Europe at the time, Middle Neolithic and the other was a uh, hunter-gatherer culture that some people thought was a um, derived version of the funnel beaker culture and other people thought might be a continuation of the Mesolithic of Sweden, which had a, uh, the hunter-gatherer culture before. So what they did in this analysis was they compared the genetic data to present-day Europeans and they found that the uh, hunter-gatherers of 
uh, southern Sweden at this time looked closest to northern Europeans, but the farmers looked extremely different and nothing like Swedes today. They looked much more like people from Sardinia or the Near East. So even though these people were living side by side for probably about a thousand years in Sweden, the population in southern Sweden at that time looked very southern compared to Europeans today, and it showed a very strong population structure. They made a model of Europe as a mixture of these two components, this farmer-like component, like the Funnel Beaker people, and this hunter-gatherer here in white, like the um, uh, hunter-gatherers they found, and they argued that there was a gradient of this ancestry across Europe, um, and that Europe today is a mixture of two divergent ancestral populations. So at the same time, we published a paper that was very perplexing to us, um, and it was a discovery that Nick Patterson, who will comment on this talk, made, which was Nick had developed a test that we call the three population test, and I'll expl explain it to you. So the three population test is a test where you take a test population that you're testing for whether it's mixed. For example, a French population, you want to know whether it's mixed of populations related to populations you're comparing it to. So let's say you're comparing the French population to population A, which might be a southern European population like Sardinian, and population B, which might be some other population around the world. We'll test a lot of different populations. And the test that you're, what you're testing is whether the frequencies of genetic variants, adenines, cytosines, thymines, and guanines that differ amongst people in the French are intermediate between what you see in the Sardinians and your other test population. If they're intermediate, the only way that can happen statistically, and you can prove this, is if the population, the French that you're testing, is mixed of two lineages that are related perhaps deeply to the Sardinians and your other population. Okay, so that was the test. We're testing whether the French population has a frequency that's intermediate between two other populations. So we had a set of 50 populations for which we had genome-wide data, and we cycled around all 50, choose two, so about a little bit more than 1,000 pairs of populations, looking for the pair of populations that gave the strongest signal of mixture into the French. One of them was Sardinians, the southern European population, and the other was a big surprise. It was Native Americans, um, either Central Native Americans from Mesoamerica or from Brazil. And this was a big shocking result to us because it's a bit crazy to think that Native Americans mixed into, the, into Europe. Um, and it definitely was Native Americans more than any other population. Siberians gave little signal, but not as strong as Native Americans. Uh, so did East Asians. So we were very perplexed. And, um, but actually, when we thought about it more, we realized that a model like this might work. That is, what we're actually seeing is that people in Europe today, Northern Europe, like French, are a mixture of at least two ancestral populations, one related to Southern Europeans, like Sardinians, and the other, an ancient North Eurasian population, which was once distributed broadly across Northern Eurasia at some point more than 15,000 years ago, went into the Americas, and also that other elements of that same population went into Europe. That's what we proposed. So it was very exciting in 2014 when, um, when another paper, not by our group, published ancient DNA from a 24,000-year-old sample from near Lake Baikal in Siberia and measured its genetic affinity to present-day populations and saw that in this heat map, there's almost no genetic relatedness to present-day people from Siberia, indicating that the present-day from people from Siberia are not particularly closely related to the people who lived there 24,000 years ago. They are replacement populations that, later, that came in from the south because of, we can see their stronger genetic affinity. But you see these two hot spots, the Americas and Europe, a bilobed distribution reflecting migrations from this ancestral population, which was once broadly distributed over northern Eurasia, into these two regions. And so what we had done here with this analysis was we had predicted the existence of what we called a ghost population, a population that doesn't exist in unmixed form, but whose in existence we can infer through its presence in mixed form in, for example, northern Europeans. And then this study found that predicted ghost. So it was very exciting, and it showed the power of ancient DNA. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how ancient DNA analysis uh, is done. Um, this is a set of bones not screened in our laboratory, but this is the set, a subset of the bones, I believe, screened in the Neanderthal Genome Project in Leipzig, in Germany, by Svante Pebo's lab. Um, these, lab these bones are taken, this is the Leipzig clean room, um, uh, in clean conditions with a variety of controls. We've now built such a, a clean room here in Boston. 
um, a borehole, a, a burr hole is drilled through the bone to try to get beneath the potentially contaminated surface. Powder is extracted, an extraction is performed. This is an extraction performed in our clean room, and it's sequenced on a next generation sequencer. So the first project that we worked on as part of this study of transformations in Holocene Europe in the last 10,000 years was the study that I mentioned to you of nine ancient Europeans. There was a high quality genome sequence of similar quality to the ones obtained today for present day people for this amazing sample from Luxembourg, which was a hunter gatherer living 8,000 years ago. Um, there were seven lower quality genomes from Motala, a hunter gatherer group in southern Sweden. And there was another high quality genome from a woman who was a farmer uh, living near Stuttgart, Germany from the linear band ceramic culture, one of the first, the first widespread farming culture of northern Europe. So what we did with the genetic data that we had was we started with data from a lot of present day West Eurasians. And the way we defined West Eurasians was just statistically, but in practice it corresponds to people living mostly in Europe today, as well as in the Near East and Central Asia, uh, Iran, um, and North Africa in practice. Um, even though that's not really West Eurasia, I'm treating it as such as a statistical group. This is a group, large group of populations where the frequency differences amongst, each other, amongst these different populations are relatively low with respect to each other compared to the differences, say, to India and even more to uh, East Asia or to Sub-Saharan Africa. So this analysis is done in the following way. What we do is we take the approximately, approximately 600,000 variable positions in the genome that have been interrogated by this, uh, um, by this experiment that we do on each sample. This is a total of 777 present day West Eurasian samples. So we have a grid which has 600,000 approximately rows and it has 777 columns corresponding to the individuals. And we measure in terms of the genotypes, so the, at each site, a person has one of two types, adenine, cytosine, uh, it, let's say we're looking at a site where some people have an adenine and some people have a cytosine. So someone can have two adenines, someone can have one adenine and one cytosine, and someone can have two cytosines. So you can code them as zero, one, or two. And we just look to see over these 600,000 times 777 grade, which pairs of individuals are closest to each other. And we perform principal components analysis, which is a, just a method of seeing which population, which, indi, which samples are closest to each other on the result, um, on this matrix. And so dimension one corresponds to the most differences observed. Dimension two, the second most differences observed. The analysis is done without knowledge by the computer of the populations of the individuals involved, but we color them afterward to help in clarity. And what you see here is a very dramatic picture that we now see whenever we do uh, principal components analysis on West Eurasian populations. And that picture is one of two parallel gradients with a pretty big gap in between with some exceptional populations in between. This gradient is the Middle East or the Near East. Here are Bedouin populations from the Southern Near East. Here are Caucasus populations from the Northern Near East. And it's mostly a North-South gradient in terms of geography. This is Europe, this is Southern Europe, here are Sardinians, here are other Southern Europeans, and here is Northeast Europeans, uh, like Lithuanians. And in between we have populations with perhaps more known recent contacts between the Near East and Europe, Greek populations and Ashkenazi Jewish populations and other Jewish populations, for example. So if you look at the positions of the ancient samples, they are here, so the farmer, um, from 7,000 years ago is at the very extreme southern end, close to Sardinia. Um, the hunter-gatherer is beyond Europe in the direction of European differentiation from the Near East, and this ancient North Eurasian 24,000-year-old sample is at the extreme north end of this gradient. So this is hand-wavy right now, but I'm going to talk a little bit more, talk in a little bit more precise way shortly. Um, the fact that this um, hunter-gatherer sample from Europe falls beyond Europe in the, in the direction of differentiation of Europe from the Near East, suggests the possibility that all people in Europe today are mixed by an ancestral population related to this, and Near Easterners and today are somewhere in the middle. And the other thing that the gradient here suggests is that people in Europe today are mixed between populations like this and populations like this, these ancient North Eurasians from Siberia, who also bear relatedness to Native Americans. So I'll now go through that. So we then try to build a model on the genetic de variation data to see, test whether it's consistent with the data that we have. And I'm going to now walk you through this model um, in more detail than I'll walk you through later claims. Um, so 
The model is a spindly graph. We call this an admixture graph or a tree. And um, the Ongi are an indigenous uh, population from the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal, um, south of in the Indian Ocean, that we use as an isolated East Asian type population. Um, we're focusing here, though, on Western Asia. Ma One is this 24,000-year-old ancient DNA sample from Siberia. Lashpur is this 8,000-year-old hunter-gatherer from Europe. We can actually test whether this model fits the data compared to Mbuti, which is a pygmy population from Eastern Africa. Um, and the claim of this model is that the uh, Mbuti are from an ancestral population that had a non-African out of Africa migration, an early split into Eastern non-Africans and Western non-Africans, and then this later split. So we can test this as follows. If we look at every position in the genome, this is supposed to represent a chromosome that one person, for example, this individual might carry, and this chromosome, this individual might carry. This is a, cyto a thymine guanine polymorphism. This individual has a guanine, this individual has a thymine. You can look at these differences and, and then ask the question, this East Asian population, the Andamanese, it, does it match the thymine or the guanine more? And so if it really is that this is the truth, then the East Asian should be equally close to these two and should match them equally often. And in fact, that's what we see. So now you take a Native American population here from Brazil and you ask the same question. Here you take this Native American population. Is it closer to this one or to this one? It's definitely statistically closer to this one. It matches different sites more often. And so that's evidence that Native Americans are more closely related to these ancient Siberians than to these West European hunter-gatherers. And again, if you take this sample and you say, is it closer to Native Americans or to Eastern non-Africans, it's closer to Native Americans. You can't get that result in a simple tree, so we need to model the Native Americans as a mixed population, consistent with that paper by Raghavan and Skogland in 2014. We think about a third of the ancestry of Native Americans are from a West Eurasian side, and the rest from an East Eurasian side. This is a really important result, because before this Raghavan paper, it was plausible to think that Native Americans and East Asians, like Chinese, were descended from a common ancestral population. But the genetics shows unambiguously that that's not the case, that the Native Americans are more closely related to West Eurasians. And we think the reason is because of this phenomenon. Another thing that we find is a big surprise that came from analysis of this gene, these genomes, a discovery that Europeans today don't fit into this model in a simple way. In fact, if you take an Eastern non-African population like the Andamanese and you ask, is it more closely related to uh, these hunter-gatherer populations from uh, West Eurasia um, or to present-day European farmers, if um, we thought these were all West Eurasians in a simple way, um, the um, Eastern populations would be equally related to them, but we don't find them. We find Chinese or these Andamanese are more closely related to these hunter-gatherers than they are to present-day Europeans. This is a big shock to us, and the only way we could explain it was that up to half or one quarter to one half of the ancestry of the early European farmers giving rise to this uh, farmer from 7,000 years ago in Germany were from an even more anciently diverged lineage that split from the ancestors of Eastern non-Africans and West Eurasians before they split from each other. We call this the Basal Eurasians. It's another ghost population that we predict existed in the past but doesn't exist in mixed form, unmixed form anymore. But with ancient DNA, it would be very exciting to see if we potentially could find it. You could speculate about where such a population lived. One possibility is it lived somewhere in the Near East for a long time without spreading more broadly outside of Africa. It could have been in North Africa. Um, and one could speculate about what archaeological cultures might correspond to it. Um, so today, Europeans are a mixture, we think, of this ancient North Eurasian component plus people like these are early European farmers. And these three components, early European hunter-gatherers, early farmers, and these ancient North Eurasians vary today in Europe today, and that's a statistically good fit to the data for most but not all European populations. So what that means is that the, the Scogland paper was right for the first farmers. The first farmers were a mixture of uh, early farmers, probably moving in from the Near East, um, although there's no ancient DNA data yet to document that, and the indigenous hunter-gatherers. And these ancient North Eurasian ancestry did not yet exist, but now it's ubiquitous. So when did it get there? So that was the next thing we sought to try to learn about from the genetic data. So the first hint for this came from mitochondrial DNA in a study in which we were only minorly involved, by our, led by our colleague uh, Wolfgang Hock and Guido Brandt and Kurt Alt and colleagues. 
In its 2013 paper, they studied mitochondrial DNA. This is only one two hundred thousandth of a genome. It's what you inherit from your mother and she inherits from her mother. Um, it's much less informative than the whole genome, but it's tended to be the first part of the DNA that people study for ancient DNA analysis. We don't study mitochondrial DNA as the main thing we study in our laboratory, but um, there's really wonderful studies that have studied it. So this study was a study, sample of about 300 mitochondrial DNAs from ancient Europeans, almost all from the same place in Europe, uh, Saxony and Germany, from 7,500 to 3,500 years ago, from nine successive and well-defined archaeological cultural contexts. And what they did in this study, or what we did, was we tested for whether the pool of mitochondrial DNA types that we saw in each of these successive nine archaeological cultures was statistically consistent with being sampled from the previous group which you would expect if this was a continuous population, one evolving into the other, with perhaps some genetic small sizes and founder events. And so when there's a dark spot here between the HGC, the hunter-gatherers of Europe, and the next population, that indicates there's a significant difference in the distribution. And between the hunter-gatherers and the later cultures, there's a significant difference indicating new populations swept in. These are the Near Eastern farmers coming into Central Europe after 7,000, 7,500 years ago with the LBK, the linear band ceramic. But after that, each of these successive early Neolithic and maybe also the middle Neolithic cultures don't change very much in their mitochondrial types, indicating relative population continuity with one population in the broad region evolving into the next. But suddenly, at 4,500 years ago, there are these discontinuities that happen. This is the late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, beginning with the Corded Ware culture and subsequent cultures, Bell Beaker cultures, and today, um, uh, and, and, and so there's a discontinuity here in the mitochondrial DNA suggesting that this transition over here might be an important one. So in the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about um, evidence of, from whole genome data about what occurred. So here's this little table. In September 18th, 2014, there were nine samples. In March 2nd, only half a year later, there were 94 samples. 2015. 2015. I'm sorry. And, um, and uh, so this paper was published in March. So um, the um, study involved basically the same series of samples from Germany and also some early farmers from Spain from the epicardial and middle Neolithic periods and a set of people who are young Naya pastoralists from about 5,000 years ago in Samara, which is in uh, just to the west of the Urals in Russia. And so um, this is the data we analyzed in this study. Also, we had some samples from other sites, for example, Hungary and southern Sweden. So here's the same picture I showed you before with these two parallel gradients of 777 West Eurasian present-day individuals. Here is the same picture, but just made a little smaller and grayed out. So these are present-day people, and I'm going to grade them out because the, I'm now going to put the ancient samples, who are many, onto this picture, and I don't want the present-day ones to be, more, to be so distracting. So I'm going to go in time, forward in time. Here are the hunter-gatherers. Here's the West European hunter-gatherers, like the one from Luxembourg, and we now had two more to analyze. Here's the Swedish hunter-gatherers from about the same time. They're not in the same position. They're more closely related to these Malta Siberian groups, as well as an Eastern hunter-gathering group. We had two amazing samples from about 1,200 kilometers apart, one from um, Scandinavia, Russian Scandinavia, and one from the Samara region that genetically were actually quite similar, suggesting this was a broadly distributed population, just like this one, which stretched at least from Hungary to Spain to Luxembourg. So after the arrival of farming in Europe, on this plot, suddenly, you see here's all the European farmers. They shift toward the Near East. This is the arrival of farming in Europe. It's a very different population. This can only happen if there are new migrants. And then if you look at the Middle Neolithic, which is the population that succeeds it after one or 2,000 years ago, there's a leftward shift on this plot back toward the hunter-gatherers. And the only way this can be explained is if this Middle Neolithic population mixes with the indigenous hunter-gatherers of Europe who have not disappeared. They are still in the landscape. And over thousands of years, they mix with the early farmers who perhaps were initially more socially segregated. At the same time, about 5,000 years ago as the Middle Neolithic, what was happening in Eastern Europe um, with the Yamnaya was a population that formed as a mixture of Near Eastern populations and the Eastern hunter-gatherers who had appeared before. 
And then only after 4,500 years ago, beginning with the Corded Ware, do we see the present distribution of Europe appear. So there is a massive event that happens after 4,500 years ago where populations like this and populations like this come together to form the present day population of Europe. Here's an estimate of the proportions of ancestry of these components. Here's the early farmers in orange, and this bar, full bar indicates a proc uh, an estimate of 100% ancestry. The middle Neolithic, our estimates are about 20% of the ancestry gets replaced by hunter-gatherers who are in the landscape and mix with them. It's a really interesting question how they mixed. Did they mix very locally, little people mixing just with their neighbors, or is it a mixture in some corner of Europe respreading across Europe? We don't know. And then after 4,500 years ago, half or even more in the case of the corded ware population gets displaced by this green material related to the Yamnaya of the steppe in Russia. It's a massive replacement of ancestry that's in the corded ware at least 70%. In fact, it's potentially more because what we see in Germany is still some of this orange and blue material, which is the early farmer and, and hunter-gatherer material, but that could have potentially been picked up by the Yamnaya-related migrants coming from the east in intervening territories such as Poland, today's Poland, or eastern uh, parts of um, the former Soviet Union. And so, in fact, it's quite possible that none of their ancestry was indigenous, that there's a complete or nearly complete replacement of the population of central Germany at this time. Today, Europeans still retain very large proportions of this green material, and so it's had a long-term impact on populations today. Um, these are northern Europeans, southern Europeans also have some of this green material, but less. So the summary of the second part of this talk is that we and others have documented two major genetic migrations into Europe. Migration number one was that of Near Eastern farmers beginning 8,500 years ago um, and bringing the LBK into Northern Europe and these epicardial samples also into Spain that genetically are very similar. A very large replacement of populations overall. Migration two was 4,500 years ago with steppe pastoralists coming into um, Central Europe in Germany, uh, uh, initiated by the corded ware, although we don't have sampling everywhere, so they could have been other populations coming in elsewhere. And in each case, there's a resurgence phenomenon where the initial pulse of people coming in uh, resolves to have larger proportion of the populations that were there before, indicating perhaps initial social stratification was overcome and the populations locally mixed to produce a mixed population that followed. So, as far as we can tell, these are the only two major migrations into Western Europe in the last 10,000 years, because present day populations in Europe can be written as a mixture of these groups. So early farmers uh, mixed with hunter gatherers to make the middle uh, Neolithic, and early farmers and hunter gatherers mixed with the steppe pastoralists to make populations such as we see today. So the conclusions for the second part of the talk is that ancient DNA falsifies the claim that there's been no major demographic turnover in Europe since the advent of agriculture. The argument for the um, arrival of Indo-European languages likely being mediated by agriculturalists arising 8,500 years ago, the Anatolian Neolithic hypothesis, the strongest single argument for that has always been that massive language replacements like follow massive population movements. And once agriculture was well established in Europe with dense populations, it would have been very difficult to displace those populations with major new migrations. And so this was the strongest argument for the Anatolian hypothesis for the origin of Indo-European languages, but it's falsified just by the data. There was a major later migration, and it levels the playing field between that and alternative hypotheses. Um, the first culture um, in the, with the steppe ancestry in our data, which is just primarily central Germany, is the corded ware, and they've been linked archaeologically, although in a disputed way, to the steppe and to the Yamnaya. Um, because of the magnitude of the replacement and the lateness of the event, it seems likely that the corded ware spoke an Indo-European language um, and that the languages of at least, at least some of the subfamilies of Indo-European in Europe, if not all of them, derive from this pulse. Um, and the Indo-European question is, of course, not solved because all we have looked at here is uh, populations in northeastern and central Europe. Um, and um, we have not looked at Iran and of India. And so, um, uh, and of course, genetics is not the same as languages. But it certainly creates a vector of populations that's interesting to think about in light of these debates. <laughs>
So part three is a, the work that we have unpublished, but that we're working on right now. And I'm going to show it. Here's the table again. So now in a few months, five or six months later, we now have 230 ensembles. So you see the number of samples that we and others are able to produce uh, using this technology is doubling every six months or even faster. Um, and, um, uh, and, it's, and I'll show you a little bit why we are able to do this. Um, the technology we're using for ancient DNA analysis is a technology called hybridization capture. Um, what we are doing is we are taking a bone or a tooth, we are grinding up the powder, which is the standard thing done in whole genome analysis of ancient DNA, and then we are taking the extracted DNA from this powder, which is mostly microbial, it's mostly the organisms that ate you when you die, um, and we are washing it over a artificially synthesized solution of little sequences that bind to the specific places in the genome we're interested in. So this is the same technology that's used to sequence, for example, all the genes of the genome in what's called exome sequencing for medical studies, where you just want to sequence the genes of the genome, which is only 2% of the genome. You hybridize someone's DNA just to those artificial sequences to select out the sequences you're interested in. It's much cheaper to sequence that. It's doubly valuable for ancient DNA because not only can we select for the particular positions that we're interested in that are variable amongst human populations, but we can also discriminate against the microbial material that is often the vast amount of fra fraction of the material in, our si in what we're looking at. So in each case, we get about a hundredfold boost in the uh, purity or in the increase in the amount of the DNA that we're interested in that we return, and so instead of um, brute force sequencing a sample um, to get a very small subset of sequences being useful to us, um, we are able to sequence much more efficiently. So you can see this, for example, in a comparison of the 160 new samples reported in this study with 100 samples that were reported in another study that came out in June by another group. You can see that with this technology, the average coverage that we obtain on the sequences that we're interested in is about four times higher. And the amount of sequencing we do is about 30 or 40 times lower. So in practice, for our samples, we end up sequencing the cost of sequencing the sample is only about $240. Um, and for a project like this, to sequence 100 samples, you need to sequence maybe $9,000 or $10,000 a sample. So it's practical to sequence and study large numbers of samples using a technology like this. And we're using genomic approaches that allow us to study many samples together and in parallel to really automate this process. So in our laboratory, we're now processing well more than 1,000 samples a year. Only a fraction of them work, perhaps 300 to 500. But we can truly generate large sample sizes now. So here's principal component analysis of these 230 samples. There are some new and important samples here that weren't there before. We have about 24 samples from the Anatolian Neolithic 8,000 years ago, um, which has been arguably considered to be a source population for the European Neolithic. And indeed, they cluster close to the European Neolithic, uh, the first farmers of Europe, although a little bit more to the Near East, reflecting the fact that uh, the LBK and the cardial wearer epicardial farmers seem to have mixed a little bit with hunter gatherers on their way moving into northern and western Europe. We also have um, some additional samples, including later samples from the steppe, that allow us to document a movement back east of European or Anatolian Neolithic type ancestry after the movement of west of steppe ancestry into Europe, which is also seen in the paper in June by the other group that has looked at 100 samples. So what we use this data for and what I'd like to highlight is a study to try to learn a little bit about how human biology has changed as the result of these movements of populations in the last 8,000 years. I think we've learned much less about this question than we've learned about population movements from ancient DNA, but I think we're beginning to learn something, and I'm just going to show you a few examples before stopping. So the strategy we took is we started with this model that you saw before of Europeans as a mixture of three populations. And then we looked in a set of 404 present-day Europeans at each of the positions in the genome we were analyzing, about 1.24 million positions um, that we were studying. At each of these 1.24 million positions, we said, are the frequencies of the adenines or the cytosines or the thymines or the guanines what you'd expect from this three-way mixture that is a good model fit to the data? So we asked that of every one of those 1.24 million SNPs of the genome, and here is the statistical significance expressed as a minus logarithm 
of the probability of seeing a solar result so extreme. You shouldn't really see points above the red line if there's no natural selection. And we found 12 regions that we think are unlikely to be statistical artifacts that correspond to various traits, um, uh, many of them dietary, like lactase persistence or fatty acid metabolism, some of them pigmentation, like blue eye color um, or light skin coloration, as well as some immunological traits and some unknown traits that we couldn't guess what the function was because basically we geneticists don't know how to read the genome, so we can't really guess what these things do. So um, here is an example for lactase persistence. This is a mutation that's one of the best characterized examples of a gene that allows people to adapt. Um, lactase persistence is uh, the ability to digest milk into adulthood. Um, normal, uh, in a lot of cultures, people can't digest milk past um, puberty. Um, and uh, in Europe, though, there's a high frequency of being able to drink, drink milk into adulthood, which is adaptive for people who are pastoralists who drink milk in their diet. Similar adaptations, but due to different mutations, are present in East Africa for pastoralists who live there. So in all of our 4,500 and 4,000 and 3,500 and 6,000 and 7,000 year old samples, the frequency is almost zero. So we see a little bit of it in the step and perhaps a little bit in the other groups, but basically it's near zero. But in populations today, indicated by the dotted line, it's much more common, indicating that its rise in frequency in the population postdates the samples we have. So this is useful because it tells you that the big rise in frequency is after this time, although it already existed as a rare mutation rising, beginning its rise in frequency at this time, possibly, although we're not certain, originating in the steppe itself, perhaps with the pastoralists who brought um, uh, widespread uh, cattle farming. Here are three, three skin coloration or coloration. Here's a genetic variant that affects blue eye color where you see most of the populations, except for the hunter-gatherers, have much lower frequency than you see in Northern Europe. The hunter-gatherers of Europe had blue eyes mostly and actually very dark skin, as you can see over here. Um, so it's a combination not seen in Europe today. Um, the last thing I wanted to tell you is what we're most excited about is the ability to actually see selection for what we call a complex trait, height. Um, and we can actually study selection with ancient DNA in a kind of meaningful way. So the background for this is a medical study which in 2010 analyzed an absolutely huge number of people who had been studied for different diseases but who had recorded heights. And this study found 180 positions in the genome that statistically significantly modulated people's height. So what Joel Hirshhorn and colleagues did in 2012 is they studied each of those genetic variants that modulate height and they said, do they of, are they systematically different in frequency in people in Northern Europe and in Southern Europe? Northern Europeans are taller phenotypically than Southern Europeans on average. And genetically, they also seem to be coded for being taller. And the pattern they found was there was a statistically significant always higher in Northern Europe. And, uh, very, and it's as if you flip a coin 180 times and more than 50% of the time, statistically more than 50%, it comes up heads. The only way that can happen is if there's been selection for either taller genetic variants in Northern Europe or shorter in Southern Europe. The truth from ancient DNA is that both occurred. So you can actually create a score on this axis of the height that's predicted for each of our groups of ancient samples. And our Anatolian Neolithic sample is predicted to be here. Here's our present Northern and Southern Europeans. Here's Northern Europeans and here's Spanish samples. So the Northern Europeans you see are genetically taller than Southern Europeans. This doesn't account for the fact that nutrition has a huge effect on height. But apart from that, these populations are genetically taller, other things being equal. And what you see is that in Northern Europe, the Anatolian Neolithic basically is statistically consistent with being the same height as the hunter-gatherers and the um, uh, middle Neolithic population. Um, but there's the steppe populations were higher, taller, um, perhaps due to increased selection for increased height in the steppe. And that taller height has been maintained in Europeans today who have ancestry from these groups. But in Southern Europe, uh, these are the middle Neolithic people of Southern Europe, of Spain, there's a significantly smaller height. So there seems to be selection for taller height in the steppe and reduced height in Southern Europe. Uh, leading to the mixture of populations we see today. Present-day Spanish are actually a mixture of Northern European type ancestry and Southern European type ancestry. So that's the end of my talk. Um, and I think Nick is going to give some comments now. <laughs>
lights up. Do, do you want this? Uh, um, uh, probably, yes. It's a big one. Am I wife talk? Am I wife for sound? I think so. Yeah. So I'm going to keep my comments very short because I think probably uh, many of you have some questions, and I'd like to leave uh, plenty of time for that. Um, so uh, the first comment I wanted to make was just going right back to David's uh, pots or, or people. Um, this has been a uh, question that's really as old as archaeology, in which you see from the archaeological record a very visible uh, cultural shift. And the question is you know, exactly what happened. Uh, did uh, did an old people learn a new trick, or did new people come in? And it seems to me, sort of looking at the archaeological literature as an outsider, these, these questions have been debated endlessly, and usually without much profit. Uh, the archaeological evidence is very thin here. I mean, yes, the, uh, the objects change, and why, and that's very hard to tell. And the truth is now we actually have a new vehicle for really settling this definitively. You get the, you get the DNA um, uh, before and after the shift, and if there's a change, then the, the, the question is really settled. Um, so that's a, a massively powerful new technique. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, something else I just wanted to comment on was the question of, of genetic continuity. Um, uh, the, um, the general idea in archaeology for at least the last 50 years, though I think not the last 100 years, is that most change has been gradual and that large population movements are very rare. Um, I think we're beginning to suspect that isn't the case. Uh, we're seeing very often uh, signs of quite obviously major population changes. And um, I think that that's going to make a massive change in how archaeologists uh, think about the past. All the same, a genetic continuity does happen. Um, I can give you two examples that we know from uh, our work. Uh, one is ancient Armenia, where uh, we're seeing populations um, in Bronze Age Armenia earlier than 3000 BC that really look extremely like modern Armenians. And that's, um, so there's an example of where I think uh, major population movements have not occurred in, in that region of the Southern Caucasus. And another example, which is very interesting, is in ancient South America, uh, where we have uh, samples from ancient Peru, I think as old as 8,000 years old, uh, which look extremely like modern Quechua uh, living in Peru in the same area. So um, we're seeing major population shifts with, I think, near population replacement are occurring uh, in the record. And at the same time, in other places, uh, there's a, a very, very large amount uh, of genetic continuity. And it's going to be very interesting getting more examples of this and trying to understand uh, uh, what we can do. So um, uh, I think that the big thing that makes me so excited about this is that the main vehicle for understanding the ancient past has been archaeology um, to a second and, I think, lesser extent, uh, linguistics have been informative, um, but um, linguistics are not useful, certainly more than for, uh, over 10,000, because more than 10,000 years ago, linguistic evidence gives out. And now we have a third avenue, uh, which uh, potentially is enormously powerful, and um, I'm just very, very excited as to where that's going to go. Now, I think I'm going to shut up now. Uh, David should come uh, uh, back again. And um, if, um, um, if there are any questions, I'm sure we'd be happy to field them. Do you need a mic? OK. Questions from the floor? Um, I'm Jerry Regeer. I'm a retired evolutionary biologist. Um, when you're talking about um, large-scale um, uh, uh, shifts, you're talking uh, genetically, and uh, whereas the archaeologist, I think, is talking about people moving in. Um, 
and I wonder, one model could be that a small number of people come in and um, <clears throat> over a, a, a relatively short period take over that population because of whatever advantages there may be, uh, which would then lead to small amounts of polymor polymorphism in the introduced um, uh, from the, the, uh, the intergressing species, uh, uh, population. Or you could have large numbers coming in with all their diversity uh, and, and taking it over in, in approximately the same time or maybe, maybe faster, but uh, historically it could still be, within the record, it could still be relatively short. Can you distinguish those two? Or have I? Well, um, the question is whether we can distinguish the models of a relatively small number of ex genetically extremely successful people displacing the previous population or a large mass movement of people. Um, sometimes it's very hard when the population sizes are above a very minimal level. What happens is that um, they are effectively very large. So, for example, a clear way to see this is if you look at the Black Death, an important demographic event in Europe, which reduced the size of the population by maybe a third, the genetic impact in terms of loss of variation is almost nothing. The reason is the population got reduced by many tens of millions to many tens of millions, and almost all genetic variants that was there before remained. And so for the population to lose substantial diversity, the founders have to be very few indeed. Um, so I think we can detect it when the number of founders is less than 100, perhaps, or you know, 50 or 10. But you have to be a very extreme founder event to be able to detect it. Um, but it, for example, I was just talking with a student about Puerto Rico today, and um, I was surprised and unaware of this, but in fact, there seems to be a founder event of European ancestry coming into Puerto Rico, a relatively small number of European uh, genetic variants contributing a lot of the European ancestry present in Puerto Rico today, suggesting that a relatively small number of individuals of European ancestry contributed the large amount of European ancestry in Puerto Rico today. It's resulted in some common genetic diseases in Puerto Rico. Hi, I'm uh, Henry Gruber. I'm a graduate student. Um, thank you for the talk. It was fascinating. When you talk about mitochondrial DNA that comes from the mother's side, does that does using that complicate uh, tracking populations where you might be having populations that are uh, skewed one way or another sex-wise or once populations move in? I mean, does that factor into considerations? Um. Uh, w one phenomenon that's very, that's potentially very interesting and informative about what happened uh, is what we call gender bias gene flow, where um, a population fl gene f genetic flow uh, is mediated by one sex rather than the other. And um, I think uh, very, very often if you see male gene flow coming in and changing the a Y chromosome, which is, comes from males, and the, uh, the main nuclear genome, and the mitochondrial DNA is unaffected, um, then that's a real signal that you've got gender bias gene flow. And I think in general, you can ex I think that's a signal of power inequalities between populations. Um, I think the common pattern is powerful males uh, come in and mate with females from the um, incoming population who are losing out economically and with power. There are many examples in history, and it's usually bad news. The, the most extreme example I know of this is a study uh, in Colombia in, in South America, which shows that the mitochondrial DNAs in, in mestizos of mixed ancestry in Colombia are almost 100% Native American, and the Y chromosomes are almost 100% European, reflecting the history there. And if you look at the rest of the genome, it's actually not 50-50, it's 70% European and about 30% Native American. And what this is telling you is that after the first wave of male, primarily, almost entirely male migrants into the region who had preferential access to females, there were later waves of male European migrants who had preferential access to mixed females, so that there continued to be social stratification over time. You can see this inscribed in DNA. It's not 50-50, as you'd expect if it was just an initial contact. It was a continuing legacy of inequality with regard to um, access to, to you know, mates. <laughs> 
My name is Erwin Shapiro. I'm in a totally different field, astrophysics, but I have wide interests. I was wondering if your methods can be used to talk or to make quantitative statements about the time it takes to make changes such as lactose intolerance or change in skin color depending on what part of the world you're settling in and things of that sort. Can you make any, any reconstructions of time scales for these various adaptations to local conditions? So in, in the case of lactase persistence, we've measured that, and the answer is that it was really absent in any substantial frequency that would have made a big difference to the population. Uh, 40, it was absent in any substantial frequency 4,500 years ago, although already existed as in rare form, and it's very common now. So the time scale over which it rose to high frequency in Europe is 4,000 years or less. So we can measure this with ancient DNA. You can also learn something from modern DNA, but the ancient DNA gives you a direct look at these phenomena. But for insights about phenotypic change and natural selection, I think we're still at the very beginning. I think the quality of the insights about history are much richer than the quality of the insights about selection, and I'm agnostic about the extent to which we'll get really important insight about biological change, but I'm quite convinced that we'll get very profound insight about population movements from genetic data. Hi, David. Uh, Adrian, I'm Adrian Briggs. I used to work with Svante Pavel and some of the early stuff that David didn't talk so much about. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so it's really cool to see, I haven't been in, in the field for a few years, so just how many samples you guys now can push through the pipeline to get such amazing population uh, data. Um, but yeah, regarding so biology and selection, which it seems like it's, it's a sort of newish area for your group compared to all your huge background in population genetics. And I was going to ask firstly, I guess as a, you know how it works, like if this is the, the next paper coming out, the part three, I can see the headline now will be dark skin but blue eyes in ancient Europeans. Even however much else is in the paper, that will be the headline. So how, are you, uh, how confident, I was wondering, are you in that particular uh, conclusion? And in general, I think you maybe just referenced it, but is this the begin tip of the iceberg for, for um, genes that have changed in recent human history, or is it more the tip of uh, just an ice cube? Like, like, you know, is it just, this is it, and there'll be a few findings, just like, you know, selection in many populations, and has been, you know, people have found a few things, but maybe it won't actually lead to uh, much, massive more insight in the next five, 10 years. I think there's intense interest in biological change and, you know, what, what makes modern humans distinct from, you know, archaic humans or what makes Neolithic humans distinct from, you know, hunter-gatherers, you know, and whether there are adaptations. So I think fundamentally people are attracted to insights about that. The f finding about blue eyes and dark skin is not... Uh, new to this paper, I sort of described it, but we already had documented it and others documented it at the same time in that first paper, and those headlines have already appeared. So um, the, um, along with drawings, um, and um, the um, general feeling I have about the possibility of insight about phenotypic change from selection is um, that it's going to be very, very hard to gain substantial insight. I mean, I know you actually worked with this for your postdoc for some of the time about trying to begin to gain insight about uh, selection from genetic variation. I don't think it's hopeless, but if you look at the cases where we have real insight, lactase persistence, FOXP2, uh, EPAS1, you, can't, it's let, you can put, count them on fingers of two hands. And in each case, the insight has come from hand-to-hand -hand combat with the gene by graduate students and postdocs over a period of many years, making engineered mice and fish. And it's not come from a genomic approach. We might get some targets, lists of things that might have changed. So there are, for example, order of 100,000 changes that have risen to very high frequency in modern humans since the split from archaic humans like Neanderthals. So each of those will require hand-to-hand -hand combat to even begin to hope to get some insight. I don't think that the rapidity of insight that comes from the genomic study will apply to selection scans. I don't think it's hopeless, but it requires really hard work in the genomic approach that I sort of am trained in, I don't think is going to be a successful one in that case. Um, I think I'll uh, mildly disagree with my colleague. 
Um, I'm actually optimistic in the long run. I think one of the problems is that um, many human traits uh, we now understand um, uh, um, uh, are, are, are polygenic, is the jargon. So um, there are many, many places in the genome affecting the trait. Each, tr each place is affecting it very weakly, but collectively there's a big impact. And um, the problem is we now understand that many of these traits are polygenic, but we don't really understand where the action is coming from. Height is a, actually not a typical example because the sample size is so big. But there's reason for optimism here. Um, uh, People are now seriously talking about collecting 10 million sequences of human DNA and doing uh, phenotypic studies. And so um, the medical geneticists are going to, to um, be able to uncover the, what's really going on biologically with many of these uh, polygenic traits. And once they do that, you can go into ancient DNA and say, oh, you know, the following 7,000 loci we know affect um, risk for schizophrenia, right? Um, what was going on in the amnea? We can't do that today very well, but I think it's going to happen. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not a fight, as uh, Philip Gerson once said to me long and memorably ago. Not, a, not a, an argument or a fight, but a difference of opinion. Um, I hope that you'll all join me in thanking our speakers for an amazing tour through the present and future of genetic, genetic history. I know there's more questions and ideas out there, and we have a reception taking place right down the hall. Go out and turn to the left, and wine, beer, and snacks are waiting for you to pursue the discussion in more uh, relaxed circumstances. Thank you again, David.